Welcome everyone. Good morning and welcome to this webinar, right? And uh, the agenda of this webinar is to help you get some insights into the SOC 2 privacy uh, principle. And apart from that, we will also be talking about a lot of different data privacy legislations and the basic data privacy principles. And uh, for this webinar, uh, we have Anil, who is a senior associate director at USD uh, Blue Conk. And uh, you have me, this is Krishna, and I take care of the security consulting practice here at Saro. And uh, we would be the panelists or the host for this webinar today. So I would just give Anil a few minutes to maybe introduce himself to the audience here. Anil. All right. All right. So good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to this webinar on SOC2 privacy uh, organized by uh, Saro. Uh, my name is Anil Lole. I'm heading the information security practices at USD Blue Conch uh, here in India and overseeing the US operations. A uh, couple of years back, we started our journey with uh, you know, uh, data privacy uh, pertaining to clients' requirements related to GDPR. And then we eventually got into uh, various uh, other areas. And uh, I'm happy and proud to announce that we are among one of the first few companies in India in IT ITES sector to get ISO 27701 certified. Uh, last year, uh, I received the honor and uh, you know, recognition from Data Security Council of India as a jury special recognition for uh, you know, privacy leader of the year. Uh, also, our organization, USD Blue Punch, won the best security practices in IT ITES sector. So been in this in this industry for almost around 24 years. I have uh, several uh, certifications, CISA, CISM, ISO 27001, and so on and so forth. Uh, passionate about cybersecurity as well as data privacy. Uh, trying to learn from various uh, you know sources. Saro is one of them. I learn a lot from uh, you know uh, these people, their blogs, their various webinars, and good to connect with you all. Uh, just to give a background, uh, USD Blue Punch uh, is a leading product and platform services uh, company. Uh, we build product for our customers. Most of our customers are based out of US uh, as well as in a UK area. And now we are spreading geography uh, uh, geographically along with our parent company, USD. And many of you might be aware about USD. Earlier, it was named as USD Global, and now it is being rebranded as USD. We work on high-tech uh, next-gen uh, technologies and provide services for product engineering as well as uh, business assurance, quality assurance. And you can know more about us on uh, www.usd.com slash bluepunch. That's all about us. Uh, or myself, uh, anything else you would like to add, Krishna, you're welcome, or you can go ahead. Thank you, Anil. Thank you for that introduction. I think uh, it speaks volumes about the experience you have in the industry, which is why I think it's uh, a great opportunity for us to interact with you as well. Right. Uh, so I'll just speak, take a few minutes and talk about Saro a little, about what we have been doing in the industry in the past year. So we are a data protection consulting firm. We focus primarily on data privacy and security. And we have been helping a bunch of our clients with improving their security infrastructure and their privacy infrastructure at the same time. And most of our uh, data privacy clients are based out of Netherlands because that is where the market is much more mature when you talk about the data privacy angle. So that is where we primarily deal with our data privacy practices. And we also help a lot of startups in India to build up their security infrastructure. So startups, uh, especially non-tech startups that do not have a technical background or don't have an IT administrator or information security personnel, they usually come to us to help us uh, evaluate their infrastructure and that is when we implement security solutions and also make sure that they are compliant to certain standards such as the ISO 27001. Uh, that is something we are going forward to and uh, of course as a part of Saro I'm pretty sure most of you must have heard about Saro Academy as well. That is our flagship data privacy uh, academy and uh, 
we have been one of the fastest growing data privacy academies in India. We only started about an year ago and we have trained more than 500 professionals across the industry. And that is something we're really proud of. And uh, of course, our blogs, articles are something you might have seen across social media and on our web page. And a little, little bit about me. Uh, I am mostly uh, very much into cybersecurity. That is how I started my career. I have been uh, dealing with a lot of cybersecurity problem statements and trying to customize solutions for our clients. And that is, I believe, where my expertise lies. And of course, data privacy is something that I'm very passionate about as well, uh, because fundamentally, I believe it's a human right. And that is my perspective when I look at data privacy. That is how I look into all the different controls that need to be put into an organization as well. Right. I think uh, now we can probably move ahead with the webinar. Yeah, so it's just a disclaimer we wanted to put out for everyone that the statements or the discussion points that are made in this webinar are solely uh, mine and Anil's uh, personal opinions or personal perspectives. Right? Uh, they, of course, do not represent SARO or UST or UST Blue Kong in any way. So these are just our understanding and our uh, you know, our knowledge about the different privacy principles that are followed in the industry. Perfect. So the agenda of this discussion would primarily start with data privacy legislations. Uh, then we'll move on to privacy principles, and then we'll help people understand how data privacy correlates with SOC 2 and how the trust service criteria within SOC 2, the privacy criteria, uh, how people actually tackle it, and what are the benefits of going for a SOC 2 uh, report or a SOC 2 audit. So it's a very easy agenda to understand because we really want to focus our conversation around data privacy. And that is why we have also compared SOC2 with GDPR and what are the differences between the, the GDPR legislation and SOC2. Right, so uh, if you have been a part of uh, SARO webinars before, we do a lot of mentee sessions wherein, wherein we want our attendees to engage with us. So if you could just quickly go to mentee.com and use the code 6650-2286. Uh, you would see different questions uh, where we want your inputs. Of course, these, these are obviously related to data privacy as well. We just wanted your opinion on a certain set of uh, different questions to try and understand uh, how you think about privacy and what are your personal uh, perspectives around it. So just go to www.menti.com and use the code 6650-2286, or you could simply scan the QR code if that is uh, more feasible for you right so this is the question that you would see on menti uh, according to you how many countries in the world have data protection laws what is your personal opinion on this uh, we have three different options which is almost all countries more than 120 countries or if you're not sure about it now uh, anil what would be your opinion on this yeah i think uh, you know let's wait till uh... Right, let's wait for people to answers. Yeah. But I think they'll probably go with your answer and you know. Absolutely, <laughs> you know, uh, there are about more than 130 countries who have already either enacted uh, or rolled out the data protection legislations or in the draft stage or in the verge of releasing. So most of the audience is correct over here. Right, I think uh, conversations have all also started to build up around the India data protection law because that's in the news uh, uh, recently, and a lot of people have heard about it. Yeah, that is also something that uh, have, you know, kind of pushed people towards data privacy and understanding its complications. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, uh, now it is getting into it's not just a personal data, it is, uh, you know, data protection altogether, uh, because it includes non personal data as well. That's true. Yeah, right. So I think a lot of people are uh, yeah. more inclined towards choosing more than 120 countries. Right. All right. So as most of you have rightly mentioned, you know, it's more than 130 uh, countries who have already enacted uh, the data privacy legislations or the data protection legislations worldwide. There are several countries, uh, around 10% of uh, the countries who are in the draft stage. Uh, so either that is being debated, discussed, or getting ruled out. And you know, there are about 20% of the countries uh, who, are not, who do not have any regulations. Uh, why we have uh, asked or we have picked up this particular area is because sometimes it may so happen that be oh, because there are no legislations, uh, some of the service providers may tend to shift to these areas. And that's when the law of the land uh, would uh, you know, get into conflict and the people who are working may have certain uh, legal issues. 
Next slide, please. All right. So when we uh, compare the data protection uh, or the data privacy laws, uh, typically, you know, uh, in India, when we uh, say ourselves that you know we are in the in services sector, you know, services outsource sector. So most of the companies are either doing business with uh, US or European Union, or they are dealing of, uh, within the India itself uh, for various other services. So definition of the personal law itself varies uh, with regards to US, European. So when, uh, when we talk about European Union, uh, their personal data is uh, definition says that, you know, any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. What it means is that, uh, you know, this is uh, from the GDPR itself because that is one of the uh, most comprehensive laws uh, as far as uh, the data privacy laws are concerned. And the there are several arrangements done by this particular legislation, which is related to, you know, having the uh, supervisory authorities. Out in US, if we consider, the personal data and sensitive personal data varies from sector to sector. So what it means is, uh, let's say for fintechs or the financial services, the same uh, definition differs for healthcare sector as well. And there are there is no single law as far as uh, US is concerned as of as of now. Uh, though there are state specific laws which are coming up, one of them is uh, CCPA. Some of or many of you might be aware, it's California Consumer Privacy Act. In India, definitely we still rely on IT Act, IT, 2000, IT Act 2000, which got amended several times. And within that, we have two categories. One is the personal data, and the second is sensitive personal data uh, or information. In India, typically, just to highlight, password is considered as uh, sensitive personal uh, information. Whereas in any other law or any other countries, password is not considered as sensitive personal. First of all, why do we implement privacy practices? As Krishna rightly mentioned at the beginning of the session, privacy is the fundamental right, uh, which is recognized by all the countries, all the legislations, and even in India, Supreme Court also has declared privacy as the fundamental right during the lot of controversies related to other card that were going on a few years back. And if the organization practices can be achieved as a benefit. So first is maximum efficiency, uh, which means that what personal data is required by the organization, only that much is collected, rest all burden is reduced. And then when we know for sure that what type of personal data is being processed or being collected, at that time, we can provide better services to our customers. The third most important component out here is risk management. See, here in cybersecurity or data privacy or data protection uh, ecosystem, what we are trying to cover is uh, the risk management. Risk management means uh, you know, reducing the risk to an acceptable level, which is ac acknowledged or ac well accepted in the industry, as well as accepted to the various laws of the compliances. Higher quality of data, because the minimum the data you collect, you may have more better visibility, better control, so that the accurateness as well as the quality of the data can be made. Once you have put in the best practices or once you have the framework placed or once you have the policies and processes in place for, for, for the organization, you can better shape yourself, you can do uh, utilize that material for your marketing purposes. You can show abilities, your competencies to your customers, your prospects. That's where you can gain and you know you can have an advantage or an edge over the other competitors. And the most important and the last uh, bucket in this particular area is improved cybersecurity. Uh, the less of the data you have, the more visibility you have. At the same time, appropriate controls are implemented. Your risk reduces. That's where you can be more resilient as well as uh, you, know, you can assure back to your customers and other stakeholders, both internal as well as external, that you have a robust system in place. I would just like to add to that, uh, since you Please. mentioned the Aadhaar information, uh, the Aadhaar, the entire conspiracy or the entire issues around it. So. Right. Uh, while I was working, uh, while I was Googling basically on some keywords, 
So I, there, what I saw was that on the website of uh, government websites had a lot of Aadhaar information that was leaked out. Uh, by a simple Google search, you can find Aadhaar numbers of a lot of different people across the country. Um, this was about a few months back. Uh, but when I redid the search, uh, as of last month, the government had plugged in all the issues. So that is something uh, that is something positive that came out around the Aadhaar uh, issues. Right? So government actively worked to make sure that they plug in the security gaps within their infrastructure as well. So a lot of government websites had this uh, publicly exposed IP that could share uh, all different types of PDF files which had Aadhaar numbers of individuals. So that is very confidential information. But then with the uh, updation of the IT Act and with the coming of the data protection law in India, the government really took measures to mitigate those as well. Yeah, it's a learning curve for all of us because, you know, we have gone through several uh, stages of uh, the personal data protection bill itself, right, from uh, 2019. And uh, everybody is working towards strengthening the security practices as well as data privacy practices. I agree. I agree. And I think uh, one more point I would like to make that uh, when we mention higher quality of data or in data privacy terms, we call it data minimization. So something that uh, uh, that is a very valid argument is that it could also limit business opportunities. So what is your take on this, Anil? Not necessarily. See, the thing is that if I'm a data processor for, let's say, an uh, European company, I wouldn't collect the data which I don't need for business processing purposes. Uh, that is one, uh, one factor over here. Remember is any multinational company are very cognizant nowadays, at least uh, because of uh, uh, various uh, data breaches, those are happening worldwide. And they wouldn't give you uh, entire database or entire data. They would restrict it, either mask it or either anonymize it. Right. So anonymization and masking is something uh, most data privacy professionals have heard about, right? It's yeah. also part of uh, the different certifications that you go for. Right. So I hope that is clear for everyone. I think uh, you know, the next slides uh, will speak about the benefits, actual outcomes of that. Uh, th those are based on research papers. Yes, of course. So now again, back to your Menti uh, tabs that you've opened up in your browsers or your mobile phones. Uh, can we quickly go to menti.com, type in the code if you've exited it. And then, uh, of course, we just have a generic question for everyone. Why is privacy important to you? Uh, just your personal opinion on uh, what it matters to you and how do you think uh, data privacy is a part of your life? Not as a, of course, a security or data privacy professional, but just as a citizen of the world. What is your opinion here? Right, so in case you're confused, you just have to go to menti.com, type in the code, and just type in your responses. It could be anything. It could be something like, oh, you want to avoid companies uh, modeling your behavior. <laughs> I like that statement because it's your business, no one else's. <laughs> Very well put. Right, so privacy is your fundamental right. It needs to be protect protected. I agree with that. Right, so I think we have a few interesting uh, statements here by a lot of people. People want to avoid misuse of their data and to secure personal data, of course. I don't want to disclose myself to everyone. Yeah, that's a very good part of uh, that actually comes as a very good part of data privacy. You don't want to disclose your uh, personal doings to anyone. Yeah, this answer is also a good one. Avoid misuse of data. You know, once the data is uploaded, uh, you can't really control over that. Right, right. So and, it is. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was saying it is uh, equally important for organizations to make sure that when they put up their privacy notices, they also mention uh, the processing that they do with the data. It has to be very clear and crisp for the user to understand, and it has to be right in every case. That is also something that would uh, help them be closer to data privacy compliance. Everyone is not required to know everything. <laughs> that's, a, that's a fun statement, true. All right, so let's uh, explore something uh, within the you know, uh, importance of privacy. First is, as the privacy uh, statement says, it's all about individuals and individuals' data being collected, which is in a mostly online form, because we work in a digital era where everything is digital. So it gives an in, uh, individual uh, control over their data, what can be used, what what can be disclosed or what can be processed and so on and so forth. 
Second is it prevents spying of any kind. You know, currently if we do the, if we check it out in India itself, you know, you may re- you may have received several uh, phone calls related to credit card or related to personal loans or something. Where yes. did this information got into? Because we don't have a strong law or strong punishments as of now. Uh, though IT Act at, to some extent addresses this, uh, you know, both 43A and 72A uh, to some extent. But uh, since India is not yet up to the mark as far as the privacy awareness is concerned, and I'm sure people would get in, uh, in the due course aware about what is meant by spying, why we don't want to get spied and all the stuff. Then another point here is uh, mentioning to worth mentioning is that if you misuse the data collected, then there should be some kind of accountability. We have seen several cases related to Facebooks and Googles of the world uh, yeah. in the past, but they are also changing their own ways to do businesses. The next thing is it helps building trust. If I share some private information with or let's say some personal information with you, or some secrets with you. I do expect that it should be kept secret. It should not be publicized. But in digital world, it doesn't happen that way. Most often or not, unknowingly, you know, the service may get hacked and the data grids, uh, goes to the dark web. That's where the collection comes in picture as well as processing uh, of uh, legitimate processing also comes. In picture. Another factor over here is uh, it protects the individual's rights as far as uh, freedom of uh, speech as well as freedom of thought is concerned. It also helps in protecting the finances because nobody wants to uh, give benefit to others because of their personal data. At the same time, for organizations, reputation is at stake. And once the reputation is gone, and uh, you know, uh, there, are, there could be a lot of consequences around it. There are several companies who have you know, shut their shops or there are s- several companies who are going through these multi-million dollar litigations. What could happen, it's not a debate of this particular session. We can have a separate session for that and we can go through uh, various uh, data breaches that have happened and the, the fines imposed by various legislations. So this is my favorite slide. You know. Uh, what are the direct benefits of uh, privacy practices? And this survey was uh, done uh, none other than by uh, Cisco, who is very renowned in their research papers, very renowned company in IT ITS field uh, for several years. And they have, uh, you know, they publish the data uh, privacy benchmark study. Uh, I was reading the latest report, which was uh, being published uh, a few weeks back. And what it mentioned is it helps in reducing the sales delay. I think, Krishna, this answers your question. Why? Because more than 90% of the companies are now considering uh, having privacy compliances or best practices being implemented as one of the factors for getting into a new business. So here is a straight equation. If you want to get into a new account or new business, you should have best practices in place. It's as simple as that, you know, if you want to get into malls, you need to show the certificate of both the doses. So you should have uh, dose one, dose two. Similarly, you should have best practices for security as well, cybersecurity, as well as for data privacy. That's the direct impact. Yes, I Uh, think I agree with that analogy. So, I mean, uh, especially the one where you mentioned dose one and dose two, of course. So also, I think uh, this particular slide also helps us pitch it to executives or the board members of a company. Right? For them, if uh, data privacy is not legislation, it could be challenging for you to help them understand why it is crucial for your business as well. So I think this is a very good source that you can use and communicate your idea of data privacy and why you think it's important. And of course, from a business standpoint, what it could uh, do for your organization as well. So this slide gives you a lot of insight into that. You can directly quote uh, these numbers and you can quote the Cisco Data Privacy Benchmark Study, which is, of course, renowned in the industry because of Cisco's reputation. Apart from that, you know, currently, if you uh, notice, you know, many of the companies are struggling with data visibility or visibility over their uh, assets and data being considered as the next oil. uh, It's not my statement. 
it is mr mukesh ambani's statement uh, who uh, you know said in a press conference uh, during the launch of uh, geo fiber and when the oil giant uh, the chairman of uh, reliance gives that particular statement we should take it very seriously uh, why operational efficiency is very important because how the data is being traveled or traversed among the ecosystem of your organization if you are not very sure if and if you have not sufficient controls on that place it becomes then really you know difficult to prove yourself or to demonstrate your capabilities to your customers you would like to add uh, krishna go ahead yeah uh, i'll take this up anil i'll take up the slide data privacy awareness and training because uh, this is something that we do as a company as well the training part of course sure right so uh, when you want to incorporate something new in the, in an organization the first step would be to increase awareness amongst the employees right it is crucial for you to uh, make sure that you can segregate employees based on their uh, privileges based on the privileges they have in the company and you can simply do a senior management and non senior management uh, segregation uh through that you can have a generic awareness training for every employee in the company but the c suite people or people uh, who are in the board uh, committee or people who are in the executive committee uh, a separate training is something that should be ideally provided to them so that they have an enhanced understanding of the privacy that they need to follow in the company but also when you talk about different employees in the company you have to educate uh, about the personal information types what are the different information types that can be considered as pii or sensitive personal data and uh, especially when we talk about sensitive personal data it differs from company to uh, from country to country it is something that is uh, particularly subjective so it is actually important to educate all your employees about the different information types and then of course you have to start with why right why do you do we need privacy so from there you can create a back story and you can help them understand that this is why privacy is required and this is how it will actually help you and it will also make sure that your data subjects or the users of your solution or product are also secure and also you have to make sure that the data that you process or the data that you use is also done in a particular manner that is uh, cognizant with organizational policies having organizational policies is very important right? you know you can float it around to different employees so that they have an increased uh, understanding of the policies as well what is acceptable in your organization and what is not then from there you can also make them understand the key principles of data privacy so data privacy awareness is the key step in to incorporate data privacy in your organization that is the gist of this slide uh, anil would you like to add anything to it definitely you know krishna you covered it uh, well uh, so start with why because it's not just a law as a compliance stuff uh, but the thing is that most importantly everybody wants and understands the importance of privacy but the only thing is that how do you define it that is through policies and processes at the same time uh, krishna you pointed out very correctly the leadership team or the man- senior management they also need to go through this particular curve of uh, learning the privacy expectations or the uh, various uh, legislations expectations or best privacy principles to follow as far as the organizational ecosystem is concerned right i agree with that completely yeah right all right so moving on sock 2 uh, systems and uh, organization uh, system controls uh, in this if you look at it uh, you know uh, this is particularly from aicta which is developed by american institutes of uh, certified uh, you know public auditors and the criteria is uh, defined as you know uh, managing the customer data based on trust service principles and there are uh, five trust service principles first of course it is uh, security which is common for all and uh, then you can uh, choose uh, to you know have it uh, either uh, availability processing integrity confidentiality and privacy so as mentioned privacy is uh, security is mandatory criteria for every organization whoever is going for sock to compliance and then other four uh, you can choose one or two uh, based on your business requirements most of the companies who are who claim that uh, you know they are sock to compliant uh, they go minimum for three criteria trust uh, service principles because that gives us uh, gives the prospect customers or existing customers a basic confidence 
of uh, you know having the robust systems coverage at at the same time the point of focus which are mentioned in the SOC two are covered. Uh, yeah. I'll just add on to that a little. So SOC two yeah. uh, has basically these nine common criteria, right? Which is something that uh, an organization has to follow apart from the supplemental criteria that is uh, provided for the additional uh, different trust service principles. So uh, within security, there are around two hundred and eight different points of focus. That is something uh, that every organization mandatorily has to follow. But apart from that, depending on the trust service principles, the control numbers or the points of focus would increase. So that varies on the auditor's perspective as well, as well as the organization's decision on to which of the trust service principles they wish to follow. Right. So coming back to our mentee, uh, since we want this to be an actually engaging session, which is why we have a lot of mentee questions uh, between these slides. Uh, right. So the question is, is SOC2 applicable to every kind of organization? So just drop in your comments here, drop in your responses, uh, go to menti.com, use the code mentioned here, and you can just type in your responses here. I, I really like people who uh, type in maybe as the answer <laughs> because they are secure from the correctness or the wrongness of the question. So I think it's really fascinating. True, but the, you know, uh, in this question, I guess majority of this, the people are not uh, answering because the total uh, is very less. So I agree. I agree. I think they're catching up to <laughs> the speed yeah, slowly. We just stay waiting for your responses because we'll take up this question in our next slides as well. Right. So I think uh, we can move forward from here. So coming back to uh, the question that we've showed in the previous slide, who does it apply to? So these are some options or some certain set of companies or type of companies uh, where SOC2 is applicable. Technology service providers, uh, these could be your cloud service providers as well. Uh, for example, AWS, Azure, uh, Azure, or Google Cloud Platform. So you would see that on their websites, they, they do have a SOC2 report that is for uh, any organization's need and requirement. As a part of your audit, uh, if you go for any audit and if there is a vendor risk management section to that audit, you can use these SOC2 reports to also showcase compliance that your vendor is someone who has a secure infrastructure for you as well. And then of course, SaaS companies, any SaaS based platform that is providing a service to different users or different businesses, SOC2 is something that is applicable to them as well. And uh, I just wanted to mention that SOC2 is not something that is mandatory, right? It is not a legislation of any sorts, but of course it is very important for you, for your organization to show compliance to security, data privacy, and of course the CIA right of uh, cybersecurity. So having a SOC2 report also gives trust to a lot of your customers and other businesses that you actually secure data and you have the right kind of controls and measures to protect that data. Uh, then after SaaS companies, we also have support organizations and third party vendors. So a lot of different companies uh, really try and understand if SOC2 is applicable to them or not. And they uh, are in this dilemma whether they should go for it because it is not actually very easy. It is a complicated process. It could take you minimum of uh, six months to a maximum of how long you want it to be. It depends on the organization size and structure as well. But a minimum of six months is something that SOC2 type 2 has that requirement. Yes, Anil. Yeah. So there are two types of certifications. One is SOC2 type 1, uh, which is just defining your organizational structure or a framework for your organization, which is custom built. Uh, you cannot just download any policies or processes and just uh, say that, you know, you have done it. Yeah. It really needs to go through the, uh, you know, the gap analysis with regards to vis-a-vis -vis what is expected as a uh, um, control expectations and what practices you, you do follow. As you rightly pointed out, this could take anywhere, you know, the type one itself takes about three months. And from then on, the entire journey starts of SOC2 type two assessment, which requires about six months of data. You know, whatever you have defined as a process or process, uh, procedures or maybe based out of policies, are you following that? Those records are verified. And as Krishna rightly pointed out, based on the size of the organization and the, uh, you know, the complexity of the various business, uh, internal business operations, it could lead to, you know, the actual assessment could lead to, uh, you know, a couple of weeks to several weeks in terms of uh, getting it assessed by you know, a certified public auditor. Not everybody can do SOC2 compliance, uh, but at the same time, uh, we need to understand if we are in the type of services wherein SOC2 is a de facto demand or a standard requirement from customers, then it is really worth doing it. 
it also changes your internal processes drastically it gets into a cultural change as well right i think uh, anil we have a few questions in the chat section i would just pose it for you uh, charmian has this question how is it different from iso 27001 we have a separate slide for that sure, and sure. even after discussing that if still the question persists we would answer that again of course of course so we just have a bunch of questions i hope we can take this up right now so if a service provider says they are compliant to soc 2 and they cannot agree to applicable data privacy laws is this an acceptable position see like i mentioned in service uh, in a soc 2 there are five trust criteria right if the organization says that they are soc 2 compliant you need to go through the report and check whether the privacy is also included in that particular soc 2 yeah if not then that means that they have not sufficient put in sufficient efforts in order to put the, those practices at the same time any organization cannot say that they do not comply with the privacy laws because if the law of the land demands you to protect personal data you have to comply with that there is no excuse and you can't take exceptions from that Right. It's right. it's a only matter just sitting on a top of it. You don't know when it is going to explode. <laughs> I like that analogy. Uh, so we just have another question. It says that is SOC two type one necessary for a company, or a company can directly go for SOC two type two? And what uh, is the benefit of having SOC two type one? See, SOC two type two uh, preempts SOC two type one. Okay. so you can't pass uh, 12th before you passing 10th is the same thing essentially what it means is if you have done soc 2 type 2 which means that you already have soc 2 type 1 and the disadvantage of soc 2 type only soc 2 type 1 is that it is based on for that particular day so let's say uh, on this particular day uh, let's say 10th of march i have soc 2 type 1 compliant assessment done by a cpa that means it is only for that particular day he has just reviewed your policies and processes he has not reviewed the controls established he has not reviewed the records and it doesn't stand in the market the people who understand soc2 reports uh, especially uh, vendor management that krishna pointed out they they review it thoroughly they go through the report when you submit it to the prospect customer and post that also there are there could be several questions come so soc2 type 2 preempt soc2 type 1 right so as anil uh, correctly mentioned that soc2 type 1 is basically just a snapshot of your current existing uh, policies and procedures so having policies and procedures and actually implementing them is a different ball game altogether so just mm-hmm. if you have policies and procedures does not mean that you're compliant and of course soc2 type 2 is the report that people are actually looking for when they uh, talk about soc2 so that is something i think uh, we all should keep in mind as well uh then i think uh, pratima has a question we'll just take up this one uh, yeah. what's your take on localization of data storage and its impact on data privacy legislation uh if you talk it from you know indian legislation standpoint as on today the proposed dpa that is uh, data protection bill it says sensitive personal data should be uh, you know stored locally within the boundaries of the country and it it should not be taken outside of the countries that's what is the uh, current uh, state is however if you look at it from a earlier law perspective you know it act point of view uh, it can be stored locally and then the copies can be processed outside if you have to interpret it that way. that's why you know if you look at various saas providers you know cloud hosting services within the india itself and there are various uh, uh, sectors with, uh, who are adopting to cloud because of uh, having local presence of the cloud services all right now this refers to the one of the uh, five trust uh, principles which is privacy privacy principles now what uh, as we have already discussed the best practices and on uh, re- you know related to collection processing as well as utilization of personal data and ensuring its safety and security at the same time you know giving proper attention to the highly sensitive as well as confidential uh, customer data or maybe your employee data that is what is expected as far as the privacy principle of uh, soc2 is concerned 
now this also addresses how this uh, the data is being collected how it is being used across various systems how long it is going to be retained which means that you can't retain the data forever there has to be a life cycle you know you you should mention that for this particular data we will retain it for let's say one year and or this particular data would be retained for 10 years due to legal requirements and then how do you disclose it so if at all you have to disclose it to the third parties how would you disclose it and then the disposal most important thing which is disposal and these are all based on uh, gap criteria which are issued by aicpa which are generally acceptable privacy principles and this overall particular trust criteria demonstrate helps in demonstrating you have sufficient uh, processes in place in order to take care of uh, the personal data being uh, used or processed within the uh, company right i think uh, i just would want to add on to the disposal part of uh, data uh, this is a challenge that we actually see in the industry because uh, organizations were not actually developed to understand uh, where the data resides of course it, it's in one of their systems but they uh, since the it infrastructure of the it inventory is so huge or immense it is not really easy to understand where your data resides and especially metadata that could actually lead to identification of a person so you know this has been a real based uh, challenge across the industries that uh, i have personally seen and uh, a lot of different companies are coming up with solutions such as data discovery tool or e discovery tools to help identify where the different sets of data are residing and uh, they are actually trying to identify or they are putting up an identifier for personal data and looking for that data in across the infrastructure so it has become a huge challenge uh, as of now uh, to understand where your data resides across your infrastructure especially organizations that have not taken data privacy into consideration but are actually a, a huge organization in terms of size and organization structure they are actually facing a lot of challenges related to this uh, the disposable part of course uh, because if there is a data subject request that comes in and your subject requires you to delete your data uh, their data from your infrastructure it is a huge challenge to actually identify where that data is being used well said krishna yep. all right so let's have a quick look at what are the privacy principles under uh, soc 2 first uh, is access uh, which is which means that the individual has the right to access his personal data based on request then uh, then we if you look at it you know uh, the notice and communications which means that uh, whenever you are collecting any personal data you need to uh, provide a sufficient notice and at the same time uh, the communication should be crisp and clear if you have noticed a simple example uh, in various shops nowadays there are cctv cameras uh, you know installed and if you look at uh, when you visit any small shops also you know there is a notice board uh, say that you are under the cctv surveillance that right. means the person has uh, given you notice before you enter into the shop and now if you enter it that means you have given a deemed consent to monitor you within his premises he cannot monitor you once you come out of the shop but at the same time within his premises he has all the rights to uh, monitor your activities uh, collection of data so how what all types of data is being collected uh, that is what uh, is expected as far as the privacy principle is concerned then choice and consent then when we look at it the choice and consent every individual should have the choice to say that you know he has given uh, his consent freely and the choice means he can opt out of it so whenever he wishes to whether he once he uh, once an individual doesn't want to avail the services any longer he can choose to uh, you know withdraw his consent and take out uh, and ask to delete the data like krishna mentioned in previous slide disclosure and notifications if uh, you know uh, if you are using the data in any other for any other purpose than earlier stated you know let's say if you collect uh, the birth dates in order to wish the person on birthdays and if you use that particular data for any other purpose okay uh, let's say you want to do a profiling uh, and if you have not disclosed it uh, then it's not in line with the privacy principles you need to 
send out the notification if the purpose also changes uh, we already discussed about use retention and disposal so we will not spend more, more time on it now yeah. important thing is quality of the data the data uh, should be uh, accurate the data should be correct if the incorrect data is collected then you should go back to the individuals and get it corrected only the updated data incorrect data will lead to incorrect decision making also and this has got and gets into a lot of issues as far as the automated data processing is concerned and then how do you monitor and enforce the particular uh, overall privacy practices or the privacy framework that is uh, that should be demonstrated these are certain privacy principles would like to add uh, krishna over here or you can go right uh, i don't think there's something i could add here because you've covered everything uh, excellently so i just uh, wanted to ask another question that's on the chat pane on the right and before that let's uh, go back to menti right it's uh, the platform where you can put in your comments and uh, of course the question we have is our privacy and confidentiality same uh, because of course the terms uh, are similar sounding because if you ask the layman what is privacy uh they would probably say it is confidentiality of my data or it is making sure that my data is confidential so but are these terms actually the same uh, so that's the question for you right so i think a lot of people uh, believe that privacy and confidentiality are not the same uh, but we have a few yeses coming up now perfect so i think uh, in interest of time as well uh, we yeah. can move to the next slide we see that 20 or around 21 folks uh, believe that it's different now uh, i'll just take this slide up anil yeah. so yes uh, privacy is actually different from confidentiality privacy is more about safeguarding your personal data and uh, personally identifiable information but confidentiality is a more generic word it is about safeguarding non personal data information and data so uh, privacy also gives you a kind of independent assurance that an organization follows data privacy practices which is mostly based on legislation or uh, mostly based on a standard such as your ISO 27701 which is a renowned standard for privacy implementation and uh, confidentiality of course it is something that you mention in contractual clauses as well with your vendors with your employees with contractors and of course when you make them accountable for the data that they handle you are also making sure that uh, there is some kind of risk which is also transferred to them right so in case of any data breach you are also holding them accountable your contractors third party vendors or employees uh, but of course that is the primary difference between privacy and confidentiality it talks about personal data and one does not talk about personal data specifically so anything you wanted to add here anil definitely you know uh, generally uh, when we uh, start an engagement with any customer they get into service contract agreement or let's say master service agreement or if you appoint a person you know if you enroll a person you generally sign nda which is a non disclosure agreement which includes both personal data as well as non personal data but here privacy talks about only about personal data and that's why if you see earlier uh, in 2019 uh, india uh, you know the executive committee uh, you know drafted personal data protection bill which is called as uh, which was called as pdpb and yeah. now it is dpp it is it includes non personal data also right right so those amendments are something that uh, the government has also considered while developing the law so uh, right. that is probably something you will see in probably the next two years hopefully right all right so these are the you no know, criteria for notice when a personal information is going to be used for any new purpose as i mentioned earlier you know i we already discussed that uh first is when collecting a personal set of personal informations you need to disclose or declare for what purposes you are collecting it if now the new purpose has been found out by the organization then you need to communicate back you have shared these uh, set of information to us and now we would like to utilize this particular data for this purpose as well in that case you need to take again a new consent let's say there is a change in the privacy notice or the privacy policy you also need to communicate that our privacy policy has been updated updated policies should be displayed in a consistent format across all platforms it's not just on on the company's intranet but it should be displayed on the internet as well and 
most important thing is uh, you know this particular privacy notice should be given to any individual at the time or before you collect any personal data now people would argue what if, what about the personal data which is already collected it's again when you start putting up the privacy practices when you start put up putting up the privacy policies from that time onwards also you can take but for that matter you need to do the uh, you know a thorough gap assessment in terms of where do you stand as far as the privacy principles implementation within the organization is concerned we have been discussing about what are uh, what is to and what all privacy benefits of privacy and all the stuff so let's quickly have a look at what is what are the direct benefits of uh, softing first is the brand reputation so uh, as krishna pointed out various saas companies are putting up their soft to certificates up on the on their websites so if you sign the agreement or nda with them they would give you the 30 40 page uh, soft to report and if you go through that you realize that the company has put in sufficient practices in order to uh, you know protect the data uh, the, which is which includes the security as well as uh, you know it could have privacy as well uh, this is again to reduce the uh, impact of uh, in the adverse case like data breach or if a security incident happens and this also gives you a competitive advantage in the market as a differentiator second is soc2 is uh, you know assured security assured security means what you know reasonable security controls are implemented so how much security is sufficient if you ask any person you know people would say the senior management would expect 100% security and we know as a security professionals in this world nothing is 100% guaranteed however in the parlance of better understanding the soc2 uh, compliance practices are audited by a third party certified public accountants uh, firm and those assure gives the assurance that the sufficient level of controls are put in place sufficient practices are put in place in order to ensure that the security is measurable within the organization and there are no loopholes or basic loopholes within the systems right the third uh, important factor over here is uh, it gives confidence to the regulatory compliances uh, as far as the regulatory compliances are concerned because if you are soft to compliant then complying with other uh, expectations of the customers would become uh, really easy you can demonstrate let's say a company now starts planning out for soft to uh, type to compliance and they include Uh, privacy as a trust criteria then demonstrating their capability competency uh, against gdpr is very easy also it gives you an operational effectiveness which is which means that you know uh, once the processes are set once it is those are institutionalized then you don't get into certain dilemma or conflicts between among the you know the different functions why and how the information should flow and uh, what are the different criteria is related to the reviews and assessments uh, from various uh, authorities i agree with that uh, i think the benefits uh, outweigh the struggle right it is not easy to achieve soc2 but the benefits are so profound in nature that it is something that a lot of organizations go for so of course uh, you know you have to weigh out the pros and cons of it the cons would be that a significant amount of resources from your organization would have to put their minds and put their efforts into achieving soc2 uh, you can't just have one person who can take care of the entire uh, project you would need uh, multiple different stakeholders to put in their efforts and to put in their time as well so that is something you have to look for so as gdpr says it is general data protection regulation it is legally enforceable however soc2 is not legally enforceable you can demonstrate your capability with regards to soc2 practices that you are and, and there is no currently certificate which is available to showcase that you are gdpr compliant there is no certification available. gdpr asks you to appoint a dto in certain cases if you are processing large amount of data and in soc2 there is no requirement as such uh, to be uh, you know appointing uh, a dedicated dpo or a dpo function the roles and responsibilities in uh, gdpr 
with regards to data controller or the data processor are uh, clearly defined and those are imposed uh, if you uh, you know look at the uh, the law uh, in detail and you know that there are fines which are getting imposed on various companies if you do not comply with the expectations of this particular law and for as far as soc2 is concerned as earlier mentioned it is relevant to your business and these are not uh, mandatory ones or there are no strict rules or sanctions if you are not complying with soc2 right so of course gdpr is something that's legally enforceable it's law it's a law uh, but soc2 is just something that is a uh, good to have it could improve your business opportunities it gives uh, trust for your employees customers vendors it gives uh, it builds that sort of trust as well and making sure that you are uh, processing the data the correct way or you probably following soc2 you are uh, compliant with that gives a good set of assurance to different customers or different uh, industry leading uh, uh, companies that also come to you for certain set of businesses so that is why all these uh, major cloud service providers they all already have a soc2 report right so i think that is the end of this webinar i believe we can probably give five more minutes anil if that's uh, possible for a simple q and a if people have some question that are still left unanswered definitely definitely one question uh, i think uh, we missed out to answer is what is the difference between soc2 and iso 27001 right which was right. asked earlier uh, so see iso 27001 is worldwide accepted uh, information security management system standard uh, okay and which also covers a uh, lot of uh, controls which are, as of now uh, the iso 27001 2013 edition covers about 114 controls yeah. but soc2 is more comprehensive if you look at soc2 privacy alone there are more than 50 controls which are expected okay uh, it is more comprehensive in nature at the same time it takes time to implement that the first and foremost it is not just uh check annually once as far as audit uh, iso is concerned you need to put in all the practices because the auditors do check all the records of from the last audit uh the another biggest difference is iso 27001 standard uh, you know the certificate is valid for 3 years whereas soc2 uh, certificate is valid up to maximum 1 year yeah. not beyond that and if you want to you know let's say if you if the organization uh, you know has uh, implemented soc2 type 2 and they got assessed in 2010 22 they cannot go in 2024 and ask for recertification they need to go through this cycle again right that's the major difference right so if uh, i think karthik has one question uh, i'm not sure about answer for this one anil so i'll just direct this to you uh, the question is can you give two lines on isae 3000 which is soc for gdpr now uh, companies in europe are going for it so if you have any uh, i'm so i'm so sorry i don't have the answer for it it's, right. but it's a good question uh, uh, please uh, take it we will uh, definitely answer uh, this particular question back right so uh, Karthik, if you could just ping Anil or me on LinkedIn so that we also have a track of this question, we'll probably do our own research and get back to you on this because it is something I'm curious about now that you've mentioned it. Definitely. Right. So, uh, perfect. Uh, I think we are good to close the webinar. Uh, we are just getting a lot of thanks in the comment section, so I appreciate for that. Uh, so, thank you so much, Anil. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule for making it to the webinar, and I appreciate your uh, insights into the entire privacy uh, discussion that we had here. and uh, of course thank you sakshi shivam prajwala for organizing this session a lot of effort has been put in by you people as well right uh, first of all thank you saru for uh, organizing this particular uh, webinar for in the interest of giving back something to the community as i mentioned i'm i'm constantly learning and i got to learn few things uh, through this particular uh, webinar thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak Uh, on this forum i know saro has been doing wonderful job in terms of beat academy or beat business beat into business and would love to collaborate with you in the future engagements as well thank you anil thank you so much for that thank you
So uh, thank you for the, all the attendees as well. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your questions. I think that also uh, helped us understand uh, privacy a little better. Of course, uh, Karthike will uh, come back to your question as well, the IIC 3001. We'll just have to do a quick research on it as well from our end. And uh, thank you for making it on a Monday morning at 10 a.m. Uh, it's not something a lot of people do, but uh, of course, thank you again. Yeah. Thank you, Anil. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Thank Have you. a good day as well. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. Bye.